All right, here we are, PergionAudio.com, with Richard Patrick from Filter. Uh, how's it going today, Rich? I'm good. How are you? Nice. Very good. All right, let's get right into it. Um, just a couple months ago, Mark Filter's first tour in mm. uh, nearly six years. Yeah. Granted, you've been touring in that time, doing other projects. Um, what's it like for this unit to be together and touring after so long? Uh, it's really great. Doing the uh, doing the old Filter stuff and doing the new Filter stuff is definitely... Uh, dream come true for me. I mean, you know, when I when I, I had personal issues back in 2002, I went into rehab and kind of just took a year off and didn't really do anything. And then, of course, I did Army of Anyone with Robert DeLeo and, uh, and Dean DeLeo and, and Ray Luzier, and that was fantastic. And we toured on that. But it was around that tour that I, we, we, were, we were playing like, hey man, nice shot, and take a picture, and welcome to the fold. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, wouldn't it be great if I actually got a chance to do Filter again? So, lo and behold, right around May of last year, I was talking to, like, my manager, and I was just like, you know what, I really kind of miss Filter. Mm -hmm. So, putting this band together was a really important thing for me, and the old Filters were, were fun, you know. I mean, you know, the first record, the first short bus, you know, it was like... We had a real punk rock ethic. We could, like, you know, just kind of flip everyone off and say this is the way we want to be, and like this is how we mean our music. And it was real kind of avant-garde and kind of noisy. And talent wasn't necessarily an issue yeah. as far as playing guitar, and you know, not to discount what everyone was doing. It was just a different ethic. It was really great. Gino was great. Brian was great. It was just a different ethic. Um, this version of Filter, I wanted like the best guitar player I could find. And like John Five helped me play guitar on, on the new record. Wes Borland helped me on the new record. Um, on the road I'm, I'm joined with you know Mitch Marlowe and John Spiker and those guys are really amazing musicians. And as well as Mika Finio on drums. So I mean I'm bringing the level of talent way higher on this yeah. one. Um, and I feel really good about that because I think Filter deserves that. Very cool. Well, of course, the new album, Anthem, Anthems for the Damned. Um, it's your fir fourth studio release, the first since the album, um, five, six years ago now. Um, how do you feel about the album? Now that's, uh, how do I feel about it? I think it's amazing. I think um, I did a really, a really great job. I mean, you know, it was funny, like, Take a Picture and, and Title of Record, for instance, that record, I think, cost like $600,000. And that was, a, you know, you know that was business as usual in the in the world of rock back then, and and you know you you can't do records like that anymore. Yeah. You can't make records that are that expensive. So you know this record only cost forty thousand dollars to make, wow. and um, you know I'm really proud of that because at the end of the day you really physically have to be responsible these days because kids don't want to buy music. They don't want to pay for anything anymore. That's right. So if you're gonna make shit for free, you better like find ways to like make it for free. Yeah. You know, um, so we're we're dealing with that. We're grab, grasping with that, and um, you know, it's all it's it's really great. I, I feel like because of that huge budgetary constraint, we came out with a record that was amazing. Yeah. It took it took years to write it, and that was that was a, a challenge right there. But as soon as we got into the the uh, studio, it was only like you know a small amount to make it. So yeah, I'm proud of that. Cool. I just wanted to touch on the title track. Of, um, Soldiers of Misfortune. Um, uh, it sort of has a first-person narrative feel, and apparently it was inspired by a letter from a fan who uh, enlisted in the army. Yeah. Um, the army reserves to get his college tuition paid, and um, during his final year, was shipped off to Iraq, where he died just a few days into duty. Yeah. Um, can you offer some more details on the story, how it impacted the band, and why this one story was to shape the song and the album so much? Yeah, I, it was, you know, it was right around 2002, let's see, 2003, March, they went in. Yeah, that's right, they went in March. So, March, May, June, July, I started realizing with the rest of the world that, well, it wasn't really about weapons of mass destruction, it certainly wasn't about, you know, um, freedom. Yeah. Um, what's it all about? Well, a lot of us started realizing that it was probably about oil. It was yeah. probably about, you know, Halliburton and, you know, a bunch of other reasons, but you know, mainly it was just not the reasons they said, which was weapons of mass destruction and freedom. So, um, you know, wow, uh, uh, soldiers of misfortune, wow, can't we learn from history? Why is it such a mystery, you know? Yeah. I'd like to break free from here, 
you know, all those lyrics were kind of being written. A friend of mine said, "You know, you have a buddy out there, a friend. Uh, my, he's a, he's a, uh, he's he he invented the first or the second filter fan website. He came up with this thing called the filtered or something like that. And you know, he was a 14 year old kid when he did it. Well, in 1998, he was 18 and he joined the reserves way before 9/11. You know, he was in the reserves. He went back into college. He." Um, you know, he was a senior in college, and they called him in and said, you know, let's go. And so he packed up all his stuff and went out, and they trained him for eight months, and then he went to Baghdad. I was writing him a letter. I was actually, I had bought a card, like, hey, man, keep your head up, you know, keep your spirits up, you're okay. He was not, he was did not want to be there. Yeah. He went because, you know, he believes in his country, and he wanted, really, the money to go to college. He wanted to study computer science, you know, the Internet kid. And, you know, sure enough, he was out there for 10 days. He started writing, like, you know, kind of like sad things in, a, in an online journal. Sure enough, he was killed. Um, you know, and that's it. That's who's fighting the war. See, you know, it, it seems like a really good idea. Let's go take over a part of the world that has a lot of oil. You know, let's go take, let's go take, you know, that's, that's Bush's thinking. Let's spread freedom. And, you know, you end up with, 22 year old kids that are dead and so um, it's a pro troops kind of anti-war song and, and it's anti all war I mean you know we're on this tiny little planet in the middle of a huge vast space and, and, and we're there's a solar system and you know it's one star you know, for our little solar system, and you know, we're in a galaxy that contains about 400 billion stars. So, life is a very precious thing. Here we are. We sit in this vacuum. You know, the vacuum of space is only 25 miles up. You, you can feel it. You know, you, 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 you know, we we see it every time they they launch a space shuttle. You, you know, it's precious. You know, we're we're just far away from the sun. We're just far away that it's room temperature usually around this time of year in Canada. It's room temperature. It's like 70, 80, yeah. you know, somewhere around there. That's pretty special, the fact that, like, we're here on planet Earth. And we're smart enough to know that we're here on planet Earth. And we're smart enough to know that war is a stupid thing. Well, why can't we stop with the war? Why can't we stop hating each other for, for you know, stupid reasons? And, you know, John Lennon said it. You know, I'm going to say it. Nyvik Ogre from Skinny Puppy is going to say it. Al Jorgensen from Ministry is going to say it. You know, Dave Grohl is going to say it. Bruce Springsteen is going to say it. We're going to have to say it until something happens, until people finally get... You know, Bono's doing a pretty good job. A lot of people use his music, and they're on their way up into the White House, you know. I mean, like, he can say, you know, like, he's saying it. You know, it's like... Rock is about that. Rock is about upheaval. Rock is about social, socially aware messages. I knew that this might be one of my last records, and um, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that cashes in on monster trucks, or I'm not going to cash in on like showing everybody my crib on MTV. Yeah. I'm not going to do that shit. I want to make music that matters. You just said there that this might be one of your last records. What? Why do you say that? I mean, it's just kind of weird. The music industry is kind of crazy. I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, it's like, I, I don't know, like, you know, I, I I just don't know how CDs will be made in, yeah. in the future. If people are only buying one song and it takes, you know, years sometimes to write that perfect song and they only want to buy one song on iTunes. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because you watch like Kid Rock kind of, flail out to everybody like he's just flailing like yeah steal my shit and steal shell oil and steal and yeah. steal computers from because they're rich and like it's just it's kind of driving people into like this weird little insanity yeah you see if i call up let's say if i call up uh, you know if i if, if i had a food replicator and my food replicator, found, well, I found a little recipe for cheeseburgers. And, you know, I, I double clicked and, and, you know, my computer made a, a cheeseburger. McDonald's would go out of business, wouldn't, I mean, like, you know, Wendy's would go out of business. Well, if you do that to music, which is what you're doing, you're going, well, I, I, I've got a food replicator. In this case, it's a CD burner. I'm just going to burn a bunch of 
songs I grabbed from a Russian.com, and I'm a burn, you know, all, all music MP3, all, all MP3.com. I'm just going to burn everything for nothing for yeah. you know. And you do that, you're putting the bands out of business, right? I mean, you you realize that. So if if you're going to do that, then I'm probably not going to want to make CDs. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see. I might put out another record. I might not. You know, I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we got in a little bit there about the uh, themes on uh, the new album, and uh, you know, they're very politically motivated, socially motivated. Um, why do you why do you think these themes need to be addressed? And can you offer some you know suggestions as to what people should do to maybe instigate change? Well, I mean, you know, when you hang out with guys like Tom Morello, you know, and Serge, and you know, I, I you know, I've spent enough time to know that like if you have a voice, voice it. You know, it's like I, I have an opportunity. There are millions of people that that have heard Soldiers of Misfortune. I know for a fact that if if, if a radio station has this much of an audience. And, and you're on these many stations, and you you know we, we had a little bit of a hit with Soldiers of Misfortune, so like all those people have now heard that song. If I know that I'm going to reach that many people, I want to say something. I don't want to say I have a nice car. I don't want to say that shit. I don't want to say I have uh, you know uh, you know it's like Bono used to say back in in in, in, in 1985 with a little record called War. He's like, I don't like this fucking non-stick wallpaper music. This yeah. glossy, non-stick wallpaper music. Yeah. He's like, it's like the music that the people are listening to is shit. And, and let's think about it. Back in 85, it was shit. There was a lot of crap out there. Definitely. And he and Morrissey and, you know, R.E.M. and those guys were considered the underground back then. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, you know, they were pissed. So they were talking about social, socially relevant stuff. And, I'm pissed, you know, I'm pissed at my fellow man, I'm pissed at a lot of different reasons, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to just sit there and cash in on, like, baby, I love you songs. Even though I've written them, and I wrote them at a time in my life where I was going through that stuff, at the same time, I'm not thinking about that shit. I'm 40, I, I have a wife, I have a baby, I'm looking around at the world as I see it, and the world as I see it is pretty fucked up. And, yeah. It's time to actually voice my is voice that stuff. So I did that with anthems for the damned. Very cool. Um, one major change about this album compared to previous Filter albums is this one's on an indie label mm -hmm. compared to the other yeah. major label ones. Um, why the switch and how has it been so far? Uh, do you find it's helped you maybe creatively? Yeah, I think well creatively, you, you know. All right, so if you're on the Titanic and the Titanic is going down people aren't really using their best wits yeah. about them. Every major label is the Titanic. Yeah. And right. they're all going down. And they're scurrying on the deck and they're trying to make sense and who's going to get on the lifeboat and usually it's the president of the label by the way. Fuck the bands. Yeah. You know, the president of the label is going to fucking help himself first and get himself a nice severance package. Yeah. Um so the bands are all getting fucked over, and, and part of the reason why they're doing that is because they're just making the bands, part of the, re the symptoms of that is they're just making the bands do whatever they can, like get out there and write a hit. And for instance, if I were to tell them that I wanted a video where the entire American flag was succumbed with a huge oil, a puddle of oil, which is what we did at the end of Soldiers of Misfortune, they would have laughed me right out of the office. And so, I, you know, I wanted to make that statement. I wanted to make that statement as hard as I could. And you're not going to have that kind of freedom on a major level. You're just not going to have that kind of freedom. At the same time, you know, uh, you know, my video is a little harder. To, well, it's not really that hard to find, is it? I mean, it's all over it's YouTube. All over it's YouTube. all over. We have it on our space. website. You know, so yeah. I mean, you know, you can see it. Any, I mean, anyone with a laptop can check out what's going on, and you know filter world by just getting on Google and finding us, you know, so it's just a matter of, of having that kind of freedom, and I, that's where I want to live, I want to have that kind of freedom. Yeah, cool. Uh, just a couple more questions for you. Sure. Um, now, Filter's music, it's always been sort of real and raw feeling, mm -hmm. um, not so much corporate per se, which we've mm -hmm. been talking about, Yeah. Um, but I do feel, I, I've listened to the album, and I it's a very honest sounding album and pure, you know, maybe um, more more so than you know, title of record and short bus. Um, 
would you agree with this? And what, if so, what would you attribute to this change? Well, I think I think title was a very honest record from a guy that was kind of, you know, starting to really, you know, grasp his, you know, his the demise of his his own intellect with with alcoholism and stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to me because I wrote from a very stream of conscious. You know, Hunter S. Thompson's my favorite, you know, novelist. You know, Doctor Gonzo. He's like that was kind of the way I wrote like I would get drunk or I'd have an adventure or I'd go to Vegas or I'd go to LA or I'd get beaten up or I'd take my clothes off on an airplane or I'd you know see a suicide and I would just write whatever that first initial thing and and it was great when it worked and it wasn't so great when it didn't work there were a certain there were a couple songs on on um on Amalgamut where I felt I really missed it. I thought I was really on it, but I was really just not connecting. Um, other songs, Take a Picture. Take a Picture, that song is the perfect song for what was going on in my life because it's ultimately the biggest like cry for help anyone could ever awake on my airplane, my skin is bare, my skin is theirs. That's about you know being yeah. crazy and looned, looned out and, you know, and taking your clothes off on an airplane. Yeah doing nutty things like that just really embarrassing crazy things like that could you take my picture because I won't remember yeah. I'm a blackout alcoholic I can't remember anything so next time take a picture of that you know I when I when I woke up in the back of a paddy wagon you know uh, handcuffed I just remember thinking hey dad what do you think your son now you know what I mean and yeah. so from that perspective, what an amazing song! Because I, it really is just it, the the whole song is just this light, airy. Because there is a certain comfort in knowing the fact that you're going to die. After you've accepted the fact that you're on your way out, you there's this euphoric kind of there was this euphoria of being drunk, but at the same time, like, and I'm okay with the fact that I'm ruining my life. I'm okay with that. That's what the song "Kill the Day" is all about on Anthems for the Damned. So. It's interesting that I bring that up. So take a picture is this is this stream of conscious kind of I don't even know what I'm writing about when I was writing it. Now I look back and I go, wow, you were there was a cry for help. You were basically pleading with yourself to, to survive through alcoholism. Then I hear Kill the Day, which is about the exact same thing, but it's written from the, the point of view of, of uh, it's just the, the lyrics are way more pinpointed and, and precise and mm -hmm. and thought out and yeah. sharp and 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 not so loosely they're not so based on like these images you know what I mean yeah I, I don't know how to describe it but it, 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 either way I come up with good songs and I'm happy with the songs and you know what I mean sobriety has helped my songwriting you know I've got it's it's easier I don't have to do you know I don't have to disappear for a month on some kind of you know uh, mushroom desert excursion to find a song. I can literally just kind of sit there with an acoustic and put it all together. Yeah. I don't have to blow my mind out on drugs to to get to the same place. I can I can write a song. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna like soldiers of misfortune, if you're gonna tackle if you're gonna tackle writing a song about the Iraq War and talk about the troops and talk about how maybe the war and the troops are two different things. You better fucking have your wits with you. You know what I mean? You you better because I I stood in Walter Reed and I looked at my record cover and I was just like, I, you know that's that's pretty ballsy to be commenting on something that these guys who I I talked to a triple amputee and I'm showing him signing my record CD and there's a there's an inverted rifle display. You know you better have your wit. You know what I mean? That's to yeah. tackle that subject. You better have your shit with you. Mm -hmm. So. I don't know. I, I I'm way. I I feel like I I'm, I'm glad I'm I'm sober to 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 at least know that like in my heart of hearts it was the it was the right way to to write a song. It was the right topic. It was the right because when you're on a six year bender, it, it's it's not good. Yeah. Now you talk about sobriety there. Um, you know you've had your battles with mm -hmm. various substances. Um, booze what, mainly. Yeah. Well, booze mainly. <laughs> um. Not trying to insinuate anything. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Yeah. But 
No, it's it's been documented. I want to I want to definitely get out of Canada. So no, no, I'm just. <laughs> no, it's been you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They stop you at the border and they're like, "What's up, Mr. Patrick? Mr. Take a picture. Yeah. How you doing?" No, but it's. I mean, it's been documented. It's been documented by yeah, your, your, yeah, your poems. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, what, I'm kidding, by the way. What's it been like? Uh, what, what's it like on the road now? Do you have, do you ever have to battle? I mean, that I I walked into rehab and I was like, "Give me a head start," you know. And yeah. but I walked in knowing full well that I was done. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm blessed. I went to one rehab. It's been five years since I went. You know, I'm done. I mean, I learned my lesson. I, I just I just can't drink like normal people. Yeah. Normal people. My my guitar player Mitch will get himself a shot of tequila and he'll sip it. And he'll sip that shot of tequila until it's gone, maybe a half an hour later, and then maybe he'll get another one. That's how normal people drink. Yeah. No my friend Maynard from Tool, he'll get a glass of wine and appreciate it'll be a nine hundred dollar glass of wine yeah. <laughs> but it'll be like he'll appreciate it for what it is that's how people drink I'm an alcoholic I don't drink a Bud Light for the taste of Bud Light I taste I drink Bud Light because it gets me fucked up yeah. and then I drink <laughs> yours and I drink yours and I'll drink the guys down the street and then I'll end up with Mad Dog 2020 with the bum in the alley that's how I drink I can't stop so you know once I realized that I I, I kind of had to take that year off because I literally was drinking before the shows to deal with the shows like I was drinking a six-pack to deal with being on stage there was a ton of nervous anxiety a lot of it was my voice how do you deal with stuff like that well you got to go to a vocal coach well how, well how do you find a vocal when you're an alcoholic those are really huge daunting tasks when you're when you're sober it's like well do the contrary thing you 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 go in and you you're like, I'm afraid to go find a vocal coach well you find a vocal coach and you and you and you you deal with the vocal coach and I learned through warm ups that I can sing five or six nights a week that's a lot of that's a lot of singing yeah, that's a lot of I drink. couldn't do that you know back when I was smoking and drinking and so I was drinking to kind of deal with the fact that my voice was you know so there's all this crazy shit. So you need like a year to, to really get sobriety before you can go back on the road. For me, that's my thing. I've seen a lot of singers that, you know, there's a singer out there right now who's just pilled out on OxyContin and, and you know, and, and he gets on stage and it's like real hit or miss and it's sad. So those yeah. reminders actually are really, you know, it's, it's sad to see those guys do that stuff to themselves. So, yeah. you know, um, I just, you know, I'm blessed, man. I'm done. I'm done with drinking. I'm done with drugs. I, I... I, um, you know, I, it's, it's, it, you know, and I, and I hire people that are like my bandmates. I hire guys that are, that are just normal or they don't drink or they're in recovery. You know what I mean? I can't have functional alcoholics in my life I, or, or, or just alcoholics in my life. I can't hire people or be around people like that. So, yeah. you know, it just depends on the, the persons and that's how I deal with it. But mainly it's just, you know, the other thing is I'm in a program of recovery and you know I get letters on MySpace for people that ask me for help and I respond to those letters and I sometimes I'll even give them my number and I'll help them through a battle of alcoholism and that's called being of service so everything that I'm telling that recovering alcoholic in their first week or two of sobriety I'm telling myself and I remember by watching that alcoholic that you know that it's a real uh, you know, issue and it's just awesome. I, there's a lot of great ways to stay sober. Yeah, I, I know Maynard. Uh, he's way into wine and yeah. he has a vineyard. Yeah, what's his wine like? Is it, I haven't is it tried his You've wine. Never tried it? No, I no. sat next to him. We I, we went to Dimebag. I was at Dimebag's funeral and I yeah. ran into him there. And he was just the sweetest guy in the world. And he has a vineyard. But yeah, Maynard's one of these guys that just like has a glass of wine yeah. and like can appreciate it. You know, and he's really into it. But he's not drinking it to get drunk. He's he might get a little drunk or a little tipsy. But like I didn't see it, and he and you know and he does, yeah. So I mean that's the way normal people. I was saying is in his case normal rich people drink where they yeah. have vineyards in their backyard. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll just one more question for you because sure. I know you gotta get. Yeah, that's all right. I'll do them all. Okay. Well, maybe one. Or two I'll tell more. you what color my underwear is today. I mean, you know, that's just who I am. Maybe we can get a big scoop here. <laughs> Today, it's gray. Nice.
you got the CKs in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta have the, you know what I'm saying? Calvin Klein's feel good on my nuggets. I'm Only the best. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, you gotta keep those vents You gotta, you right? gotta keep your nugs properly circulated. That's why my beauty, my bit, my be my baby is so beautiful. It's because my nugs were in the right place. Yeah, man. You know what I'm saying? It gets hot up on stage. Yeah, you know? it's good. You know. <laughs> Not to mention the uh, the gyrations. <laughs> Lots of gyrations. <laughs> <laughs> You're not gonna use all this. You can't. You cannot use all of this. We might. <laughs> we love it all. <laughs> It'd be a four-parter. <laughs> Anyways, well, I'll just uh, ask you any final thoughts. Sure. Thoughts on the state of the world, how we can fix it, if filter as a band. I think it's just real more. easy. I mean, you know, if every person did the right thing, you'd still have a music industry. If every person did the right thing. Um, you know, maybe we wouldn't have war. Do the next right thing. Yeah. You know? For the Shiites and the Sunni, try stop killing each other. Yeah. Um, you know, Israel and Palestine, stop killing each other and maybe try and work out some kind of thing with the land issue because obviously they, they like their land too. Um, okay. Oh, let's not be such crack whores for oil. You know, just off of the top of my head, you know, just a couple little things. Oh, maybe not pollute the planet. Yeah. Maybe not pollute the planet so much. These are all just little things, you know. I mean, it's real basic stuff. Don't kill each other. Be good to each other. Don't steal from each other. It's just basic shit. And if we don't, if we don't, if we, if we, if we stop reminding each other that, and if we just have like singers like poor Britney Spears, bless her heart. You know, it, it's a. It's like I'm amazed that like no one in the world really wants to have like the conversation. Like, we live in a world where, in the music business at least, you can get on a game show. People would rather watch on TV three judges pick a singer for them. Yeah. And then they'll make that singer a millionaire. And then they'll make. You know what I mean? Like. It's, it's, and it's the same singer. American Idol, it's the same singer. It's, they're all the same. They're soulful, like, pop singers. Would Perry Farrell ever have made it? Would Nyvik Ogre ever have made it on fucking American Idol? Uh, would, I don't mean to diss it, but it's always the same kind of singer. Yeah. It's, it's not an intro, do you think Neil Young Hey man, take a look at my life. <laughs> you think Bob Dylan would have been? They'd be laughed off. They would be yeah. laughed off the fucking stage. <laughs> oh, how dare you for coming here? Was your, no. You know, if Bob Dylan, hey, you know, Mag down on Maggie's fine. You think he would ever make it on American Absolutely Idol? Absolutely not, no. So, that's who you're fucking, that's who you're, you know, shit, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. That's who we're relying on to say. And do you guys watch American yeah. Idol? American Idol is huge really. no. in America. Yeah. No, it's well, huge here right. too. So. Yeah. I mean, well, Canadian. That's the thing. I mean, like, who's gonna fucking? Who's gonna fucking like? When are the brains gonna come back? You know, in the in the in the fucking like entertainment world. Yeah. You know. And uh, just what's next for Filter? I don't know. We're gonna do this tour. We're gonna finish this tour. Um, I'm probably gonna do another record. But I want to tour this record, and I want to get it to a, a, a you know a good spot. I want to make sure that a lot of people hear it. And in this case, you know, you got to go to shows. You gotta you gotta play gigs. You you gotta play festivals. You know, um, and that's what we're gonna do. Probably for another year or so, and then we'll go back into the studio and work hard on another record. And that record will come out pretty quickly, hopefully. Yeah. Because. I don't want to do any more screwing around. I really love Filter, and I really, I really, you know, it's it's my legacy, and I really want it to be around, and I want it to be as big as it can be. So, cool. Thanks a lot, Rich. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. No worries.